add audio input capture and add your mic. Testies, testies, one, two, three, testies. Anyone? Yes, sound. <laughs> oh, you can hear us now. Can you hear us? Ah, ha, ha. Can you hear me? Can you can hear, hear all three of us. Yes, okay. <laughs> very good. Well, I guess we're starting now. <laughs> Once again, very, very late. This is uh, the RPG Pundit, the final boss of Internet Shitlords, along with... Uh, uh, Joe Bidman, and tonight our special guest, Grim Jim, our former co-host and current special guest of the evening, uh, Grim Jim, our... <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, I think uh, since, he, since he quit the show in a huff, he has gone on to become even more inappropriate than he was when he was ever on this show, but we'll be talking about that shortly. You may have yeah. noticed that our third regular co-host, um, uh, Avengers Satanis, is not here, and that is because he is currently sick with a, an array of symptoms that certainly sound like they could be a certain flu bug. Uh, well, not a flu bug, but a certain type of virus of Chinese origin. <laughs> and uh, we are, we're all having a bit of a chuckle about that. So <laughs> uh, he, is, uh, he, is, he is not available. I, I, unfortunately, I did not inquire before he, he announced he couldn't make it tonight. Uh, about what his vaccine status is, and I don't think he's on the chat right now. If you are, Venger, let us know. So are you are you proof that that uh, that the vaccine works or that it doesn't? <laughs> anyway, um, tonight we'll be talking about a variety of subjects, but our main subject is uh, about obviously our special guest star tonight, who is someone that a lot of the, those of you who have been watching us from the beginning are are obviously familiar with and those of you who joined us later um, might still know about him because if you're watching this show there's a good chance you're, you're familiar with the osr and uh, grim has certainly done his share of osr work so um good to have you back grim jim uh, um, thank you i'm glad to see you here yeah back back amongst my fellow hive of scum and villainy so excellent and um well why don't we start with you giving us Bit of an update of uh, well, for, first of all, you were supposed to be here the, in, the, in our previous show and you had to cancel at the last minute because of a health problem. Do you care to give our audience any update as to your current situation? Um, yeah, so <laughs> I went to the optician to get okay. some new glasses and they scanned my eyes and uh, my corneas were distorted and I had loads of blood hemorrhaging. Um, in the, in the backs of my eyes, the, the fine capillaries and things, which is a sign of a problem. So they sent me pretty much straight away to the hospital, uh, saw the ophthalmologist in the hospital, um, and then I was just going to take your blood pressure after a whole bunch of other tests. And then I was like, oh, oh, your blood pressure is spiking at 260. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, they rushed me down. Uh, put put me into a bed, gave me these intravenous drugs that made me I incredibly sick, and uh, over several days managed to get my blood pressure down to about 160. Um, and since then, they've they've put me on some blood pressure meds, and I've had to do some lifestyle changes. So I'm trying to do tonight without caffeine. So we'll see how that goes. Oh man! Um, yeah, Damn. but the the med the meds make me pretty sick. Um, I'm, I'm just about getting you getting used to them now. So, yeah, um, I've got to make some changes. We still don't really know what the problem is, and I haven't been able to get in for a scan yet because there's a lot of post-COVID patients using up the MRI. So, yeah, I'm, I'm in for a bit of a wait till I really know what's wrong. But they've ruled out my kidneys and a couple of other things, so it's probably endocrine system, which means... Uh, thyroid or adrenal gland so it might be related to my anxiety issues so so yeah i don't know yet but my blood pressure is down to about 140 to 150 i've got another med adjustment coming up so hopefully i won't have a stroke live on stream 
Well, let's hope not. <laughs> Although, only that don't. would probably get us a lot of views. So, you know, yeah. it's up to you, man. <laughs> Feel free, <laughs> one way or the other. Place play bets, stroke, embolism, aneurysm, heart attack. Yeah, yeah. Elevated risk yeah, for all of those you, things. You heard it right here, folks. The the inappropriate character cast and alumni are dropping like flies. <laughs> put, your bets, put your bets on who will be the last man standing, you know? <laughs> well, we, we should uh, make some kind of a tontine or something, you know? <laughs> but, yeah, the last thanks. inappropriate character to survive <laughs> gets the copyrights to everybody else's work. <laughs> But yeah, th thank you for asking. It did it did come at the most inopportune moment for for lots of reasons. But uh, I'm I'm on a more even keel now and and coping. Yeah, well, we were all worried about you there, um, obviously, and we're glad that you're feeling well enough now, at least that you were able to to come and join us tonight. I'm sure all of our fans are. Um, although Malachi says my money is on RPG Pundit as the last survivor. <laughs> thank you, Malachi. That's a you know that's also an amusing. Uh, choice given that i'm you know a, a well-known chain smoker of well uh, albeit of pipes i don't i don't smoke cigarettes you know? but i, I will have you know as far as i know i am in perfect health right now for a man my age you know so i i, I i've never even had a cavity <laughs> i don't know what job's how job's doing how are you doing job are you well I'm pretty good I, I i my teeth were real good till recently but i got myself a gold tooth now Oh yeah. Cool. Well, that happens to everyone eventually. It just hasn't happened to me yet. Yeah, I, I never well, I don't want my teeth to fall out. I told the dentist, I was like, "Can I get a gold tooth every time?" She's like, "Sure, why not?" <laughs> you just didn't <laughs> fall on the monster on yeah. it, so right? gold teeth. <laughs> I, I reckon Pundit will go first, smothered in his sleep by a cat. That's what's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, Big Chungus is a constant threat. <laughs> it's just the food that keeps keeps uh, keeps Big Chungus from eating me. So <laughs> the kibbles are the only thing between me and being cannibalized by Big Chungus. Uh, Judd Goswick says, just knowing Pundit is a risk. <laughs> so he also says, Job has gone 10% pimp. <laughs> yeah, knowing Pundit certainly doesn't help my blood pressure. Put it <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sorry to hear that, but uh, I guess that, that 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 would be the case for you and you know about 200 SJWs too. So you got to look at it as a uh, in the balance of things, right? You're you're, you're taking yeah. one for the team, Grim. Uh, yeah, yeah, the stress of the world. <laughs> so the other thing is that since you you've been in pretty busy since the last time that you were on board. Um, and uh, you, um, you've, you've done a number of projects. Uh, I know that there's a lot of people that wanted to, to you know, when I posted the ads for this live stream that said uh, they want you to talk about, um, was it Whitechester? Mm -hmm. um, but I want to hear basically about what various things you've been up to since you uh, quit our show. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, 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 hold um, on a second. I, you know, I just want to interject and, and make you talk about one thing first, because I got a slide for it. Okay. Okay. Oh, not that one. That one. Table topless. Okay, Grim. I got to tell you, I am totally a fan of this now. So just so everyone knows out there, you know, you go to, to tabletopless.org, and it's how would you describe it, uh, Grim? What? Motherfucker. What? Same line in as it was before. But you can hear Pundit? I can't hear. What the hell? Okay, so Grim's audio is gone. Am I gone is too, guys? Anything? Megan says she can hear you. The 
uh, the rest of the audience is saying they can only hear you. So. Okay. What the hell just happened? What's up? I, I didn't touch a thing. Okay, you know, I'm going to switch back. I'll switch back to where I was. Can you talk now, Grim? If you switch to a different... They can, they yeah, can hear me, to... but only very quietly, apparently. Oh, I know what's going on. Everyone's hearing you through my speakers. That's what's fucking going on. Ah. <laughs> uh. Yeah, the input isn't working. Okay, I'm going to move my microphone over to my speakers. Talk to your grandma. Okay. All right. Well. Testing. Okay. But I'm, I'm back. Okay. okay. Uh, where were we? You asked about tabletop. Um, yeah, so what it is, is it's part ongoing role-playing campaign and part porn, uh, part sexy times. But the two are kind of together. So the, the players are in cosplay and we try and work the sexy times and the weirdness into the, into the campaign, into, into the game world. Um, so they're a band of merry rebels in a world that is controlled by immortals who want to try and control everyone's, well, everything, but sexuality in particular is, is how they rebel. Um, we also did a short cyberpunk campaign We'll be doing a short Witcher campaign in the near future and a short Vampire Masquerade campaign. It's a it's a lot of fun. Um, they're they're really good players, good good friends to me now. Um, it's it's a lot of fun, <laughs> and um, yeah, if you if you like to consume that sort of sort of thing, I I can recommend it. Certainly from the from the gaming side. I'm putting as much effort into it as I would any any campaign or, or set of game supplements or or, or whatever else. Um, and we tr we're trying to find a balance between that kind of performative aspect that you see in something like Critical Role, because to an extent you have to do that if you're doing a presentation, but also keeping a lot of the flavor of of a normal campaign. So all the tangents that people go off on, the bad puns, um, flailing around trying to remember the right rule. So we're trying to present role playing in a more <laughs> authentic way than Critical Role does, I guess, <laughs> but also with tits. Okay, <laughs> so I have several questions. <laughs> and uh, I mean, to start with, let me preface by saying that I, I've never actually watched this thing. Um, <laughs> but uh, I guess, huh? My first question is: Is this profitable? Are you making a lot of money from this? Um, well, we have to we have to split the money, obviously, uh, and it's taken an investment of effort. And we just had to take some time off in, in part because of my health issues, but also uh, people doing various other things uh, over the summer. But well, maybe yeah, we Panda could fill in for you for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, it, it makes it makes a good amount of money. Uh, it, well, that's good. It's nice to hear that. I guess now, I feel I feel like a bit of a uh, a cheat because you know I'm not performing. Shall we say? And I'm still You're getting some of the, the money. But, uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. But uh, well, you know, I signed up for the adventurers uh, level. So if you guys want, you can sign up for five dollars for five days, and then it goes to the normal subscription fee. Uh, so I'm not sure if I'm going to keep my my subscription yet. But I I went in and I watched the first episode, Grim, and I have to tell you that I, like I just thought it was like a joke or something. I watched this thing and I was blown away. Like it was actual art. It was really, it was really freaky. <laughs> and uh, the your, uh, I'm just gonna word it like this: your take on like the DM, like the the GM's reveal. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I I was pretty shocked. So it was. <laughs> I would love it if everybody that watches this show ponies up five dollars at least to watch the first episode zero point five or whatever it was because it was just like, <laughs> what the fuck? 
Anyway, the GM's reveal. I'm not sure what kind of reveal we're talking about here, but I don't think I want to see pictures. <laughs> did you did you plan all that stuff, or did they come up with that? Um, I'm a very improvisational games master uh -huh. normally, so I tend to riff off what the suggestions that they have. Okay. A lot. Um, but obviously, playing D and D, you do need to plan ahead a bit because it's a prep heavy game, you know. So I, I I have ideas and fallbacks and hold it all in my head. Really, that that's that's how I do things. I, I think all the great GMs feed off what the players give you. So some comments here from the audience. Mister Triceratops says, "Did anyone else giggle when he said putting effort?" Um, <laughs> Well, you, you know, people are, people tend to think that, oh, you're just going to rely on the naked stuff and you're not going to put effort into the game. Nah, that's, that, that's not who I am. Rakapol says, we will pay Grimm to hide his, his uh, nudity. <laughs> <laughs> One million dollars. Anyway, Kevin DeJordi says, Jim is revealed, confirmed. <laughs> Anyway, so, uh, you know, I had to do I had to do research for this show, so that's really the only reason I signed up. <laughs> I, I usually do research for this show, but I have my limits. So, uh, <laughs> here's here's you know, but we do ask the tough questions of our interview people on this show. So here's my question to you, and this is this is going to be a, a difficult one for you to answer, Grim Jim. Okay. Uh, do you think that of the audience, the more pathetic ones are the ones that only come and watch your show to fap to the nude people in it <laughs> or the ones that come to your show and do not fap to the nude people in it because they're only there to watch the role playing <laughs> <laughs> i don't i don't think either is 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 pathetic um you know I, I wouldn't i wouldn't diss the audience and you know i'm i'm very sex positive a lot of the fans engage with us on the discord server and so on uh, we've only had a couple of creeps who we've had to give give the boot to, but most most people are pretty pretty cool. But if you are just coming for the game, then you're probably a little bit sadder. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's like the equivalent of the person who's like, yeah, I buy Playboy just for the articles. <laughs> for the article. <laughs> yeah. I'm just no, no. I'm just watching that because I, you know, Grim is such a good DM. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm in deep throat as as a medical drama, not the not the pornography. You know, this poor woman, she's well, a clitoris. You know, I think I, <laughs> I got to admit, Grim, I think you've inspired me. There's a certain genius in this. So I think that at this point, what I'm going to do is uh, for my my last son campaign, which is you know you you've got currently we 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 recorded on audio and it's on Bill the Elf's channel. I think we're going to start recording it on video, and we're going to. To charge people, um, we're gonna have the people are gonna have to fundraise up to a minimum amount for my players not to be naked on that video. <laughs> and yeah, as that word will make more money than you will. <laughs> <laughs> be careful. There's all kinds of people into all kinds of things. You never know what you're gonna. Gary <laughs> Mitchell says, "I knew it. Porking with pundit coming soon." <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, so aside from your your move to to soft to, to apparently profitable softcore porn, uh, what is uh, really what, what other things have you been up to in the in the interim since the, my audience last saw you here? Uh, I'm trying to think how long ago it was. It's quite a long time, isn't it? Um, I've put out some support materials for tabletopless so people can take the the non-porn elements <laughs> into their own games i've been doing a lot of consultation i i enjoy doing that um consultation with uh people who are trying to publish like their first rpg or whatever so i can take them through the pitfalls and the budgeting and the, yeah all, all of that kind of stuff and that's that's really rewarding i really enjoy doing that um, and sometimes I help more directly by helping people publish, you know, th through my storefront um, and so on. So I've been working with a, a guy from Portugal called uh, Miguel Ribeiro, um, and he's just a machine. He's he's pumping out all kinds of, all kinds of stuff. Um, he's really into the kind of giallo Italian pulps. 
um, and you know, like Dario Argento and stuff like that. So we've got this kind of surreal horror sort of sort of scenarios that he's been putting out, and I've been doing the layout for. I've been getting more into doing more complicated layout. Um, so that that's that's been interesting to be a bit more arty and pretentious. <laughs> yeah. um, see, Morkborg interested me, but I think they went a bit too far to the point where it can be almost unreadable. So I'm just trying to find this kind of sweet spot and um, and playing into my my aborted artistic education <laughs> to to try and do things uh, a bit more complicated, a bit, a bit more different. Um, yeah, and then no, the 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 big project is is Whitechester, which uh, the funds funds still running for a few days. It's been funded, apparently, right? Yeah, we we hit the hit the target goal. Um, and what's and it yeah. about? Okay, well, I was going to say any any extra money will go into additional art, and obviously because I got knocked out by the by the health issue, I've had to hire some people to help me. Do some of the some of the writing, um, or rather, they volunteered to help, and I want to give them some money. So that's <laughs> yeah, it's only yeah. fair. Uh, so that's what's going to go. What's going to it's going to go into. So Whitechester is a city crawl set in a slightly alternate history uh, city in England in 1667. So you know, so during the Restoration period, just after. Uh, Defoe's diary of a, of a plague year in London. So we've had we've had the Black Death. We've been at war with the Dutch, and then I throw a supernatural element into it. So a, a baleful comet comes across the sky. Some fragments fall to earth, and the the dead rise. But because everything's mobilised for war, and there's all these Civil War veterans and so on uh, around, they manage to put the dead down, except for one city. Uh, which just gets walled off, sealed and surrounded, and then starts being used as a, as a prison, uh, somewhere to execute people without actually executing them. You know, it's cheaper than transporting them to the American colonies or, or whatever else they were doing. So they just, um, yeah, anyone who would be executed. It's, it's a bit too early for the bloody code, but things were pre pretty bad in the 17th century. So, you know, if you're a poacher or a Catholic or, or you know, a, a rebel, a ranter, a digger, a leveller who's run afoul of the authorities, um, you know, if you're still agitating for, for a republic, or even if you're not guilty, but they think you are, you can just get shoved into this city full of the undead and then try to survive. So it's, it's an insanely detailed city book of a fictional city that has been closed off and, and left to the dead for about a year and then you get thrust into it and have to survive and maybe along the way you'll find out things that happened in there get to the bottom of some secrets perhaps maybe even escape who knows sounds very interesting now is that a is that a setting or is it is it also like a, a full rpg like does it have and if so, is it is it OSR or is it something different? It's a setting book um, to encourage people to to fund it. Um, I, I offered various conversions, so it will be five E compatible. It will be Grimdark compatible, which is my hack of five E. Um, Lamentations. Lamentations is my mm -hmm. sort of hold to the, to the OSR, so it will be compatible with that, and it will be compatible with Morkborg. Because you know, oh. OSR stuff is simple. Doing a conversion for that isn't isn't too difficult. And, no, it isn't. Uh, uh, Grimdark is an easy conversion for Five E. <sighs> that gives it more of an old school flavor, I think, but also e even grittier and nastier than a lot of old school play is, I think. What I hope to try and do is to kind of bridge the gap a little bit. Maybe I can drag in some 5e players, show them different ways of playing, make them aware of different kinds of system, different kinds of story, so on uh, that can be told. 
Um, I've actually been planning this since about 2013, uh, but a very similar story came out in comic book form, so I didn't feel like I could do it at the at the same time. Um, that's happened to me a lot in my career, having the same idea as somebody else. A bit unfortunate. But yeah, I hope... <laughs> I hope well, or bring... fortunate, depending, right? Because well, yeah. even though somebody might might think you're being derivative, it also means you may have captured a zeitgeist of the time, right? Yeah. Um, well, I'll give you a quick story about one instance of that. Uh, when I brought out Agents of Swing, which is my sort of homage to spy-fi 60s and 70s serials, mm -hmm. I pipped... Gareth Scarker at the post, he was thinking of doing something similar. Mind you, we'd probably still be waiting for it if he had. That's to right. it. So oh 20 years God. later, he'd still be working on it, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. That, it, yeah. It, um, but I think enough time has passed now that I won't be considered as, as, as derivative. Some comments from the audience here. Emery Calamy says, uh, the real reason Benger is not here, he's been surpassed and needs time to arrange an entire gaming con around nude role-playing. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin DeJordi says, I've heard the Spanish-Brazilian markets in South America are really hopping for TTRPGs right now. Well, you know, there's been an active RPG design movement in, um, in, in well, in, uh, particularly in Spain and in Brazil for a very, very long time, right? Uh, which have produced some very good games. Um... Yeah, I got a I got a Spanish translation of one of my games as an experiment, um, but that hasn't really put on. I don't I don't have a window into the culture of mm. sort of um, South American or, or or Mexican role playing. I don't know how to reach the people there. So, but it was worth doing as an experiment. Um, and I'm hoping Miguel, who's, who's Portuguese, I'm hoping maybe some of his stuff might catch the attention of some Brazilians. So I, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Indigo Dragon says, Venger is planning the Alpha Blue LARP video special. <laughs> <laughs> Todd Goswick says, I can't imagine Gareth Skarka's spy fi game would be as good as Agents of Swing. So there we are. Yeah, he was going to call it Agent of Fate. Um, or agents of fate so i i don't know uh, but it was a very similar idea but i beat him to it i had a similar idea to far west at the same time that he had it as well um and i decided oh i'd better not do that then because he's going to be doing it how little did i know <laughs> my uh fellow latino here geeky bugle says brazil even has its own osr and so does spain yeah that's true there's they're big on both of them i've been interviewed by both Mexican and Spanish YouTube people about uh, um, about RPGs, of course, and it, it it probably helps a little bit to market if you uh, if you can speak Spanish or Portuguese. Yeah, I can't. I, <laughs> I can't I really a... speak Portuguese, but my Spanish is <laughs> pretty pretty damn fluent. So I, I have enough Japanese to order whiskey. I have a little bit of Finnish, a <laughs> little bit of German, a little bit of French, but. Uh... Sinocephalus says, good to see you again, Jim. Um, Thank you. Judge Gods Goswick says, uh, Jade Punk is far west, done better, and well done. <laughs> oh, and well <laughs> done. Uh, 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 <laughs> uh, 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 uh. Right. Far west didn't go very far, or west, says Indigo Dragon. Um, <laughs> Xenocephalus, uh, subscribe. Thank you very much, Xenocephalus. Welcome aboard, Sinus Apples. Um, Emery Claim says, Vieja Escuela. That's, that's not quite it. In South America, we, we call the OSR Vieja, eh, vieja Escuela. Because you got to watch, uh, you got to watch the gendered language there, right? Because uh, everything is, you know, Escuela is feminine, so it would be Vieja Escuela. But in Spain, they call it something else. They call it like Viejuña or something like that, right? Which is a, a, a very Spanish grammatical thing to do you know like spanish from spain i mean not spanish the language um it's uh there's there's significant dialect differences between spain and and latin america well and be between different parts of latin america so i don't know if vieja escuela is what they call it in mexico for example um 
<laughs> Darren Schultz says, I can barely speak my native language. Well, there we go. Oh, Geeky Bugle confirms. Uh, no, Geeky Bugle says in Spain it's vieja escuela too. Well, that's that's every every single interviewer I've had from Spain doesn't call it vieja escuela, but maybe maybe other people do. Maybe it's a regional thing in Spain. Just keep in mind that in different parts of Spain, in some parts of Spain they don't even speak Spanish. So there we are. Um, Basques splitters. Yeah, well, not just the Basques, like the Catalans, for example. Mm. Um, Megan asked if um, did you already, did did you already ask Megan's question? Or did it cover? What, Sorry, what was that? Did you already ask Megan's question? It said Megan uh, said uh, who did the cover? Oh, who did the cover? Art? Sorry, yeah, I missed that. Oh, don't ask me to remember people's names. I'm terrible at that. <laughs> um, I can't remember his name offhand, which is terrible. I can't even remember his Twitter handle. But he's done some bits and pieces for Games Workshop before. Oh, nice. Very cool. So, Emery Calamy says, In Valencia es vieja escuela, <laughs> which is making fun <laughs> of the, the Spaniard accent, right? In, in Latin, Latin America, America, we all find the way people, people from Spain speak Spanish, Spanish to be very funny. funny. Um, <laughs> Judd Gosswick says, A pen dragon book about El Cid. Well, you, you know, know what? what? I, I, I mean, I would someday consider doing um, a line, you know, right now I'm working on a lion and dragon book about the Crusades and the the Silk Road. But, uh, you know, and then I'll probably do another one about some other period of English history, but I would certainly consider doing one about the, the times of El Cid, because uh, that's some, some really great potential for a lot of interesting gaming there. Uh, of course, Spain has its own medieval authentic game, Aquilari, which is much older than, than, you know, Dark Albion or anything. It was certainly an influence on Dark Albion and Lion and Dragon. Um, and it's a, it's a great game. Um, oh, we've got a, a super chat. Iron Caster uh, says, hope you're feeling better, Grim. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll get there. Thank you. We, we really thank Iron Caster for paying me and Joe money for saying, for wishing Grim well. <laughs> yeah, geez. I wonder how much we'll get when you die. <laughs> Five bucks, maybe. Grim Jim had his chance at the big bucks and in, in inappropriate characters in literally the tens of dollars that we make in this show. <laughs> but he, yeah. he, he threw that all away to get into porn, you know? <laughs> <laughs> what, what a foolish, regretful decision. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I, I suspect you're raking any more than inappropriate characters does, but there we are. Who's echoing, by the way? Some, they say they're hearing an echo. You guys, it's going to echo. I uh, The way I worked around it is uh, I've just put my microphone against my speakers and turned it up a little bit, so <laughs> the audio is going to be shitty today, so at least we have audio. Sorry, guys. This is like the ultimate Job jury rig. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, for some reason, Google, uh, I, I pay for freaking Google Meets. They changed it so you can't output audio to a virtual audio cable for some reason. So ridiculous. Typical crap. You know, you don't realize until you go to turn it on. Like, why is it not showing up? Not there anymore. Every oh, single time. Geeky yeah. Google says the tech guy is a boomer. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm a half a boomer. Oh, we just got an uh, Emery Calamy says sent us uh, ten dollars uh, super, super chat, chat saying Alexander Hamilton says hello. <laughs> <laughs> All you, right, Emery. so if you guys have any questions for Grim, him being the yeah, we the can guest of some questions tonight, here. Uh, uh, we'll feel free to, to post them. Yeah, uh, Joe, do you have any questions for for Grim? What? First, I'd say the crowdfunder is still open. It's on Indiegogo, White Chester, White as in the scary creature. Um, I think there's five days left. <laughs> I just backed it right before the show, so um, it, it looked really good. I would recommend backing it. There we I got go. a few of your books, though, so. Cool. I'm a fan. Uh, but yeah, yeah questions. questions. I'm, I'm better at responding to questions than I am at just talking about stuff. So, um, Joe, any have you got any questions for Grim? Well, I, yeah, I got plenty of questions for him, but we just got one in the chat room. So Geeky Bugle says, uh, "Yeah, what about white box conversion of White Chester?" <laughs> uh, I think I've got enough conversions on my plate. 
and I think there's enough there that it shouldn't take much work to convert it to anything else that you want to. Right. Yeah, I mean, if you've got a Lamentations conversion, you've got an OSR conversion. I mean, you could use it, you know. Yeah. You could do that. With, you can use it with any OSR game. That's that's the beauty of the OSR, right? <laughs> that everything is compatible. All right, so I got a question. Uh, we can wait for the chat room to fill up with some more, but... Um, so I, this actually comes from Tabletopless. I was watching your episode and you were going through your bona fides. And one thing you mentioned, I've seen this book before, uh, was the Munchkin, uh, what is it, Munchkin book for power gamers or whatever? Munchkin's Guide to Power Gaming. Yeah, 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 yes. right. So you, I, I'd seen it before I flipped through it. Um, I think I used to have a copy, but I looked and I, I, I don't have it, so I don't know what I did with it. Um, but you mentioned something on that show about you kicked off all the stuff. So did... The, I got the impression when, from what you said, did the Munchkin game come after your book? So me and my writing partner, Steve Mortimer, who, who went back to sort of normie jobs after that, uh, we wrote the Munchkin's Guide to Power Gaming, which was one of a whole bunch of pitches we sent to every role-playing game company we could think of back in the day, just, just looking for work. Steve Jackson game seemed to see something in it, and so... Yeah, gave us the job of writing it. Um, for those who don't know, it's just a it's just a comedy book about all kinds of stupid stuff around games, really, but loosely themed on power gamers and the and the shenanigans they get up to. But it did really, really well. Um, what yeah, an it was illustrated by by Kovalik or whatever, right? Some of it was Kovalik. Some of okay. it was Errol Otis, I think. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, maybe Ooh. someone else. Um, but yeah, it did, it did really, really well. And then Steve Jackson Games wanted to cash in on that. So they did some D20 supplements for it, which, which did okay. They wanted me to work on them, but I just started a normie job at the time and I wasn't really, really up for it. And then that, in turn spawned the card game so our book inspired all of this stuff and then the munchkin card game basically saved steve jackson games right, from yeah. from going from going under uh unfortunately it was our first job the contract wasn't particularly favorable to us and so we've never seen anything of the, of the munchkin millions unfortunately wow. that, that's that's pretty that's pretty amazing actually it's like a that's a near miss. That's like one of my friends who had all like, you know, 50 Bitcoin that he like left on a hard drive somewhere and <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> found it again. So uh, Indigo Dragon says, are your Grim 5e rules available to see? Uh, you will have to buy them, uh, but they are available. I can give you a very quick sort of rundown. So there's familiar character classes, but they're all a bit different. So instead of uh, a monk martial artist, you basically have a, a, a thug, a bare knuckle brawler. Uh, in place of the fighter, you have a soldier. Um, the biggest changes are probably around the magic. Magic is much more heavily constricted. And priests, clerics don't really cast magic per se they more bolster people's morale um and if you want to wield actual magic then uh, you have to be more like a a western ceremonial magic ritual magicians of binding demons and it's more about getting gifts from them through the through the deals that you make with them rather than having spells you can just fire off ne necessarily so you might make a deal with a, a some some demon or other, and they might gift you the, the tongue of birds so that you can speak to birds or or understand their language, um, or you might be granted a gift of an amulet that could protect you against fire or something, or a, or a magical dagger. There's not a lot of magic weapons or anything, but that's one way you could get access to that. And the other sort of true magical tradition is um, more kind of witchcraft, but I've tried to make it a kind of syncretic 
thing where it's the it's the old faith, but it's also the kind of herbalist wise women, the the, the cunning folk as we used to call them here, um, but also intermingled with the way in which that's been reinterpreted through the Christian faith. So, yeah, a lot of grimoires and witches and so on were either propagandistic or they were people who'd bought in the narrative that they were yeah, making deals with with the devil and going out on sabbats and you know smearing themselves with with baby fat or, or, or whatever else so i've tried to kind of formulate all that together in addition but um yeah hit points are restricted magic is restricted and the kind of abilities and capabilities that characters have are more low-key but i think more interesting if you have to think tactically I hope that answers. Kevin DeJordi says, uh, when did you first get some other writer designers products on your Postmortem Studios website? Uh, when did I? Uh, probably, well, I've had a long-standing deal with Brad McDevitt, who is um, a fantastic industry veteran artist, worked for Games Designers Workshop, there's a lot of work for Goodman Games at the moment, and we, we struck a deal, basically, where he produces stock art and a lot of his old stuff. He makes deals with whoever he works with that it reverts to his ownership after a certain amount of time, and we put that out as stock art. So it lets us help up-and-coming games designers by having a huge catalogue of art. It helps me because I can draw upon, upon that catalogue and it helps Brad because he gets you know, a, a certain amount of a, of a steady income from it. So he's the first guy I really worked with um, and split money with. Then I guess Ian, who did the um, Tough Justice, Courtesans, those sort of historical, very simple system games. Um but uh, he he then left to do his own thing. Uh, but it, it was like I said with the consultation. I really enjoy helping people get their get their stuff out there. Um, the, the the consultation gig is just I I don't know. There's just something rewarding and different about it. So much of the hobby is so negative these days that being able to help people get something fresh and new out there is. Um, I don't know. It just, it, it makes me happy. Yeah, it's good work. So, uh, Charlotte Williams says they, they, they skipped over my question. Clearly they're afraid of people finding out the truth, pr paralyzed at the prospect of being revealed by this serious question. Have you got any <laughs> weed? Have I got any weed? Uh, I yeah. don't get on. I don't get on with weed. Um, <laughs> it's, it's too much like being bored out of my mind. I, I don't know if that was a question only for you or for all three of us. So, Job, <laughs> would you care to also provide an answer to that question? Uh, well, le weed is legal in this state. Um, <laughs> that's my comment. Okay. <laughs> As for me, you know, weed is also quite famously legal in, in Uruguay, um, but I do not have any weed. Um, I haven't had any weed for quite a while, but, uh, you know, there was a time and a place for weed and it's called college. Um, <laughs> I literally, you know, I'll tell you guys a little pundit story here. Um, in, uh, the last year and a half of my bachelor's degree, I was, uh, renting a two bedroom apartment with a friend of mine whose dad who has since passed away. So I can probably say this with some security that it's, it's not going to have any repercussions. Um, his dad was the one of the big uh, weed dealers in uh, the city where 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 I was, <laughs> and uh, he was the biggest, maybe the only uh, LSD dealer in the entire city. And so, for that year and a half, there was a, I did not have a single day in a year and a half that I was not high. <laughs> <laughs> but then, you know, I, I wow. got more seriously into uh into the esoteric let's say into mysticism and magic i 
I, I joined various sects and things like that. And, uh, and uh, I kind of outgrew the, the need for psychedelics to bring me into altered states of consciousness. So, <laughs> you know, I haven't really done very much of it since. And, and from what I understand it from some of my Canadian friends who have been to Uruguay, the, the weed down here is just not nearly as good as Canada's. So, uh, yeah, that's my answer. Uh, other back to a, another topic here. Uh, Mr. Triceratops says, uh, "Is Whitechester inspired from a particular city in the UK?" Uh, several, question. yeah, se several cities. Um, like, what was your process? Did you? I assume you did a lot of research on. Well, I mean, at least if I was doing this, because like I've literally done this with medieval with some of my medieval city books and. But it presents is intense research on what that city was actually like in the 16th, in the 15th century, in my case, and in your case, I guess. Yeah, uh, so 17th took century. Inspiration from cities in the 17th century, I take it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so my family history ties back quite strongly into the English Civil War on the side of Parliament. Uh, in fact, there was one of the major generals. Uh, was Sir Jonathan Disbrow. You had who... to be descended from roundheads. Jesus yep. Christ. Um, Speaking so he was, of he was one of the cavaliers. <laughs> <laughs> so he was one of the guys that actually signed the death warrant for the for the king. Um, and he, he was he was quite successful but also quite quite repressive. Um, but I'm still still quite proud of us having having cut the head off a king. The whole the restoration was a mistake. <laughs> so I already, I already had an interest yeah, in that. In I'm, that era I'm sure a guy like you would have absolutely loved living under Cromwell. <laughs> absolutely not, but yeah, sacrifices have to be made. <laughs> so I was already interested in that period, and okay, jo joking aside, the Restoration was a really interesting period of British history as well. You have the Royal Society, which is kind of. A, the foundation of modern science, as, as we founded think. Founded by the Invisible College. They were all magicians. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's that's really interesting. And the magician link is, is really interesting as well, um, especially Newton, um, who was an arrogant prick, uh, also a genius, and also heavily into alchemy and, and ritual magic. So he's a fascinating figure. Um, but I based the city partially on Winchester, which is where I went to. I went to college, uh, partially on Salisbury, which is where I went to art college, and partially on Canterbury. I didn't go to college there. I just visited quite quite a bit. Um, so it's kind of a kind of a mix of those. But Winchester, in that period, despite having been the capital of England at one point was a really small sort of fading wool trading town, which, yeah, would, wouldn't do. So I, I kind of made it a bit bigger, a bit more interesting. Um, but, yeah, I've, I've done a, a shit ton of, of research. Good stuff. Several people ask me about pipe tobacco. Well, I'm currently smoking uh, uh, Lorenzetti A uh, with Argento Latakia that uses real Syrian Latakia. And that's uh, some high quality pipe tobacco. I find that that provides my provides me all the intellectual stimulation I need without <laughs> without the element of the munchies and things like that. So, <laughs> so Flash um, Gorgon asks. Uh, Wikipedia says that some of your work, Grim, is hateful, violent, and misogynistic. Do you think that they realize that these are selling points? <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, I don't. Someone put a wiki page up for me. Uh, I edited a few details because there wasn't enough there, and a couple of things were wrong. But then someone added that, and no one seems to have been able to get rid of it. So I, I don't know. I don't think that's true. I think it depends on your on your point of view. But um, you know, if that's what you're into, then by all means, my stuff is chock full of that. Absolutely. <laughs> wink, wink. Well, I don't. I, 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 I've never seen. Yeah, I've seen a few of your products. I've seen all of your products, but but I haven't seen any of your products that could be could be listed as hateful. 
And as for violent, what RPGs aren't violent? Like, I mean, every RPG has a huge section on combat, right? I mean, like, so, so what are they even saying there? Now, yeah. misogynistic, well, um, well that, that depends a bit more on your point of view, right? But well, seriously. Yeah, I, I subscribe to the thought that sexy doesn't automatically mean sexist. Um, yeah, I agree. And when I make jokes in that kind of sphere, the butt of the joke is usually the guy uh, rather than the woman. So the I wrote the Slayer's Guide to Female Gamers, which was a, a comedy book for, for Mongoose Publishing. And lots of people have held that up as some sort of example of, of my misogyny. But the butt of the joke throughout the entire book is how clueless and socially awkward a lot of male gamers are, right? That was the ho- that was the whole point. So it's kind of the opposite of misogynistic. So what I think it really is is that a lot of these people in the I don't know what you even call it pseudo left. I mean I, I'm very left wing. I've been away a while. You may have forgotten. Um, but these these people these people are wearing the left like a skin suit, and their sex negativity is is not something that I subscribe to. But that's. That's where I where I think it comes from. Taryn Chul says the pundit into the occult. I'm shocked. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Dracopol says RPG pundit was an RPG or so already damned. Weed or the occult would only be the cherry on top. <laughs> um, Dracopol refers to the the I guess it was the the era of the British Civil War as the, that that uh, period of British history. Uh, was the Society for Putting Severed Heads on Top of Other Severed Heads. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And banning Christmas and dancing and music. Yeah. yeah. Basically a less colourful Taliban. Yeah. Notable that most of the people that, that founded the Royal Society, um, members of the Invisible College and, uh, and the early Freemasons were, were all Cavaliers. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean... Hey. I, I, uh, yeah, the the, un, the unlimited divine right of kings to absolute rule is a really good thing for England to have gotten rid of. Which you know, it's hard it's hard to argue against that. Um, but very clearly, the um, there a great deal of the inspired creativity that led to the modern British state, and then to the from that to the modern world was a product of the restoration and you know having yeah. a having a very restrained monarchy was probably a lot better than having a a pseudo democracy run by um religious by Puritans, basically yeah yeah they, i mean there was some innovation under under cromwell but it was mostly in warfare um, yeah, well, the new but, model army, you know, was his, yeah. was the, the the killer yeah. app there, you know, obviously. Yeah, that's when we started having this this small, very professional army, really, for the first time. Um, whereas before, it was all levies uh, and, and so on. That's when it really came into its own, and I think that really became the the model of, of English soldiery, you know, right through the Victorian period. Yeah, have that's a small, true. very professional, very effective military. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So this might be a good time for us to do our pimping while people, uh, while, while we are pimping our products, um, people can feel free to add more questions for Grim Jim or any of us uh, in the chat, and then we'll address them. But uh, Job, uh, where, where do you want to start with the pimping? Uh, well, obviously with our guest, uh, the, the right. esteemed James Burrow. How do you say your name anyway? Desborough. Desborough. Like, yes. Desborough. Very British pronunciation there. <laughs> we got all your crap on the screen, Graham, and your and your uh, your mug. Good, good. So talk about your crap. I got Whitechester. I got postmore.com. I got your channel. I got the tabletopless. Awesome. Uh, right. So, yeah, I have a YouTube channel with about four and a half thousand subscribers where I talk about gaming stuff and politics and cultural observations and whatever takes my fancy. 
Uh, there'll be a semi-regular podcast on sort of futurism and technology that I'll be doing with Rachel Haywire, which will be on there as well. Uh, so that's uh, youtube.com slash postmortem video uh, should take you there. Um, so tabletopless, tabletopless.org. Uh, we stream on many vids uh, once a week, once we're, once we're back, and we should be back this coming week. Uh, picking up with Aerotech, which is our, our 5e campaign. And we'll be doing Vampire the Masquerade, uh, the, the new edition, though I'm a bit uh, about the new edition and some of the rules changes, but we'll be doing that in October. And then not long after the second season of The Witcher drops, we'll be doing a, a Witcher short campaign um of, of a few Ooh. sessions for that so it should be interesting i'm looking forward to see what the what the girls have come up with for their for their cosplay for that so that that'll be interesting yeah. um postmort.com or post-mort.com um i've seen the way the wind has been blowing in terms of censorship and interference on sites like Drive Through RPG and, and others, so I thought it was a good idea to set up my own online store. So that is my own online store where I basically don't have to worry or I have to worry a lot less about censorship. So if you want to buy anything from me in PDF form, that's where I get the most compensation from. So if you if you want to make sure I get more money. Um, and if you want to support free expression, it is Banned Books Week. So, you know, that's a good place to buy. And um, Whitechester, I think we've got four or five days left on the crowdfunder. So that's your opportunity to get in and get a, a cheap copy of the main book. And I'll be comping anyone who supports it with a free copy of Grimdark and maybe a couple of other goodies as well. Um, and if we do break £3,500, there'll be an introductory adventure, uh, which I'll put out for people. I think that uh, that about covers it. Very good. Very right, great. You're up. Uh, what is, what's your name? Pundit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, <laughs> so... Um, I'm, I, you know, I, right now the latest product I've done is the Invisible College. Um, currently on drive through, as you can see in the the image that Joe put up there, it's a silver bestseller. Um, of course, it's also been selling a lot on Amazon. So if you don't care for for drive through, you can buy it on Amazon. But if you if you do use drive through, it would be really great to get it up to uh, well the next. Uh, I guess Electrum bestseller would be the next step. So, uh, it, but it's it's been it's been selling really really well been running well people have been talking about it lots of people running campaigns of it um my campaign of it is going really well and for those of you who who haven't heard somehow the invisible college is a modern rpg an osr system rpg with obviously uh, some very interesting rule mods for running a modern setting game um that has to do with secret societies mainly the invisible college which was founded back in the time grimm's book is set in uh in the 17th century, um, a secret society of, of magicians that are fighting in an occult war against other secret societies to determine the spiritual evolution of humanity. It's a lot of action, lots of magic, supernatural elements, lots of conspiracy stuff, um, secret intelligence agencies having their own occult divisions. Um, the, a lot There's rules for creating your own organizations within the Invisible College, rules for um, how... You know, if you're doing high level play, so to say, how, how uh, the different conspiracies to manage the different conspiracies, gamifying the um, their control over mundane organizations, you know, different institutions and uh, and and uh, movements and things like that in the world to try to uh, push their particular agendas of what they think humanity should be, whether, you know, humanity should be enslaved under an autocracy or. Um, transformed into some kind of different species or uh, 
should just cease to exist or only certain people should get to exist or it should be thrown back into a dark age of, of uh, um, religious superstition or if humanity should be liberated by the, the power of uh, autonomous individuals having freedom to develop their, their self-actualization. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a game that has a lot of different ways you can run it and can do a lot of interesting stuff. And of course the magic system, just like Lion and Dragon, has a magic system that is based on kind of medieval authenticity, what the what magic was understood to be like by people who were doing magic in the Middle Ages. The Invisible College's magic system is based on real world modern occultism. So some very interesting source material there. Uh, apart from that, you can uh, pick up all my other stuff also at Drive Through RPG. Um, I'll give a little shout out to World of the Last Sun, which is also currently a silver bestseller, and it's probably bound to hit Electrum pretty soon here. Um, World of the Last Sun is a great 278-page Gonzo world book full of different, you know, interesting material, rules, items, um, creatures, races, all kinds of things that you can use as a complete setting in and of itself or cannibalize into your setting um lots yeah you know, it's got sci-fi elements and weird fantasy elements lots of great random tables and uh, it's definitely uh, a, an excellent source book for anyone who enjoys slightly weirder styles of fantasy so be sure to check out world of the last Sun. <laughs> and of course as usual my rpg Pundit presents series i've been told by by specter press that there's that we're going to get the next um RPG Pundit Presents issue out quite soon now, and apparently it's going to be an adventure, uh, Last Sun setting adventure, called uh, The Perils of the Sunken Skyship, which can can also obviously be run with any OSR game. So uh, be on the lookout for that when it comes out. It might come out this week. And uh, yeah, I guess that's it for now. Job? Okay, so... My uh, my my new book from Lamentations is coming out. I think it's going to arrive from the printer in Finland in like three weeks or two weeks, um, and that is the Book of Antithesis. So that is a book of of uh, real occult magic uh, practice for dungeon masters for building your game world. Um, and then if you look on the screen, you can see if you if you email me at uh, orders at Bloody Hammer Games. Um, I've still got a couple copies. I'll make some in the future, but I've got two copies left of the Bone Divination for Game Masters. Um, this is this will get you started with uh, doing the divination practice that's in the Book of Antithesis. Uh, so you get what do we got? We got one. You get six marked cowry shells, one one gold cowry shell. Come here, uh, and then you got three milagros, um, and then the whole chapter of the whole divination chapter from the book, I I shrunk it down and I put it in this little booklet in here. So if even if you don't buy the book and you just want to um, try divination for yourself, um, and uh, you know contact me, get me one of these. I only got two of them built, so um, I got to order more parts and then I'll you know spend a, a long afternoon assembling a bunch more of them. Uh, I got fanfic, the erotic storytelling game. And I still have like 30 copies of Into the Demon Idol left. Um, so if I uh, reprint it the next time, it's probably just, uh, I'm gonna do like the Brutal Blades version. So still working on Brutal Blades and, and getting that out. It's getting closer. Um, I'm really shooting to, before March of next year to have some kind of printed uh, like play test version of it out. Um, and uh, yeah, that's about it. And then, so while we were shilling, we got a uh, a super chat from our old pal Dracopol, who said the first eight to ten fans should be able to break thirty five hundred pounds. Oh wait, Grim meant British money, <laughs> <laughs> as opposed to weight, right? <laughs> oh, oh, it's Canadian dollar, so whatever. Ten, ten Canadian dollars. Sorry, I, I didn't mean to denigrate your currency. Thank you, Dragon. I really much appreciate it. Canadian dollars. You, you've got no standing to criticize British money. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, we can't talk shit about the pounds. Whatever uh, the hell they're called. Malachi's Material Musing said, Amazon does not have Invisible College in stock currently. I, I don't know what, which Amazon you're on, Malachi, but I'm, I'm just, I, I quickly pulled up the Amazon 
you know, the standard Amazon.com page, and it does say it has one used copy and one new copy in stock right now. So <laughs> ironically, the, the used copy, well, the new copy is $44. The, the used copy is 43 And of course, the Kindle edition is there uh, as usual. Um, so I'm not sure. Maybe you're looking at it at a different from a different country. Could that be it? Um, it but, could be, uh, yeah, because yeah, you go to Amazon in a different country. Like when I was in Mexico, it like redirects you silently to like the local page a lot of times. So, Lynchman says, if the magic system in Invisible College is based off modern magic, does that mean that there's a faction of Tumblr witches in the Invisible College? No. Uh, Lynchpin, the, one of the first premises of the Invisible College is something I, I've said many, many times. Anytime that I've talked about, you know, um, real magic and RPGs and stuff like that. So one of the first things you have to understand about the real occult scene is that 90% of the stuff in it is crap, right? <laughs> and, and so this is, one of, this is one of the fundamental premises of the Invisible College. So you can actually find all kinds of real stuff out there, but the, the problem is that it's hidden under, you know, nine times as much stuff that's just nonsense, right? And, and so um, the, 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 the premise in the Invisible College isn't that everybody who, who says they're in the, into the occult can do real magic. It's that there's a tiny group of people, um, not only in the Invisible College, but, uh, but, but um, nevertheless, a, a tiny group of people who have actually figured out how to, you know, do magic that actually works. Um, George Whittlebach, Lorraine McClary, and Hoopy, Hi, by the way, I hope, George, you've been watching the last couple of episodes of the uh, Last Sun campaign because <laughs> your plot line is developed, uh, but uh, you have still failed to kill Boy Boy. Um, he asks, uh, how would you incorporate tea leaf slash coffee ground reading into D&D? That sounds more like a question for Job than for me, I think. <laughs> That's you know, sort of I, stuff. I, I could do it. I But, you know, I really I haven't studied uh, tea leaf um, reading at all. I don't know how it works. Um I assume I assume it's something to do with where the the leaves are facing or something, but I just don't have the system works. I'm sure I could figure out how to to plug it into to your game world, though. Well, you have to drink loose leaf tea, um, which most people yeah. don't, don't yeah, like do these days. And looking down into the bottom, you look to see what shapes they make, and then you interpret the shapes. That's mm. that's basically okay. how it works. I'm not sure how to plug it into the system, system that I'm using in in. Uh, in the book of antithesis, these, but. Terrenchul says, oh, no, meme magic. Well, actually, Terrenchul, um, in the Invisible College, it's very clear that you can do, you know, what what uh, I've termed cyber magic, borrowing a term from chaos magicians, including that that you can use the internet to, to, do, to do magic that affects people's perceptions. So meme magic is in fact real, you know, and, and tremendously effective. I think, you know, <laughs> even people who don't <laughs> believe in the occult at all will certainly believe in the power of um, using symbols in a particular way and transmitting them in such a way that it creates um, a mass alteration of opinion. So <laughs> that's, I'm magic. that's, I'm that's magic. That's magic. I'm imagining a chalk circle with a picture of a Shibs Inu in the in the middle. Lol. Much magic, so powerful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, J uh, Judd Gossick says Invisible College does have cyber magic. So there we go. Um, all right. So uh, now that we're in the the back end of the of the show here, um, I guess it's time to ask an important question of you, Grim. Um, okay. You very famously left inappropriate characters fundamentally because I was opposed to lockdowns and you were highly in favor of them. And uh, I guess I want to ask if in the year and a bit, well, year and a half, I guess it would be since uh, since uh, you quit, has your opinion changed at all? No, because the statistics show that they were effective. Um, I don't think they're needed <laughs> anymore as the vaccination rate <laughs> climbs. Um, but yeah, I still think it needs to be still taken seriously. Now, I may be biased because I'm high risk. I've got some lung damage from when I was a kid and, and so on. But um, but I, I think I've been basically pro proven right. Well, <laughs> I would obviously argue that you're wrong. And the funny thing is you live in a country that had a number of serious lockdowns, not as serious as some parts of the world, not as serious, for example, as New York City or or in parts of Australia, where today we have seen 
um, police engaging in incredible brutality against people trying to stand up to to insanely totalitarian lockdowns there. But um, but, you know, nevertheless, England had some some very serious lockdowns. And I lived in a I, I was just by sheer luck, ended up being in a, one of the few countries in the world that had no lockdowns. And the president of Uruguay, uh, Luis Alberto Lacalle, who is now, you know, I was I, I've managed to spend like 18 years in this country without having any particular interest in any of the local politics and not <laughs> particularly liking any of the local politicians. And in one year, this bastard has made me into an actual fan of him and his party. Right. <laughs> because he said, you know, we are not willing to create a police state um, and and to repress people um, uh, who, if, if ra- instead of asking people just to be responsible for themselves. And that's that's what he did. There were no lockdowns here. And uh, and and Uruguay was the least harmed of any of the. The, you know, economically the least harmed. And, and it was also, I think, socially the least harmed country in all of South America because of that. And mm. it has he's, he's continued to be um, vindicated at every step. He also, of course, did some very intelligent things. I mean, he cut off the border. Yeah. At which which is sensible. He also um, doubled the number of ICU beds in the country. And he was an early adopter of, of a mass vaccination program so that now you know, considering that in particular Uruguay is a third world country, it's there's a quite remarkable rate of vaccination now in the, you know, mm. um, I think it's close to 80 percent of the country is now vaccinated. I, I got vaccinated like a question of two or three months to, to a level of like 70 percent. Right. So it's uh, yeah. it's he, he did a stunningly good job there. But, um, you know, the, this country is living proof that you know there was the, the, there wasn't a, a significant difference there was a spike at one point then there wasn't but there was a spike in the UK there are multiple spikes in the UK there were multiple spikes in California right and in New York I think, so, I, I think it, it does depend on which country you're in obviously um like you say you, you Uruguay shut the shut the borders pretty quick here in the UK we're run by incompetent bumblefucks so we didn't and it was too late <laughs> basically right but you're you're trusting incompetent bumblefucks with your I freedom don't. <laughs> i don't trust the incompetent bumblefucks i do trust the nhs as an institution um <laughs> and and the the men in gray suits in whitehall tend to actually know what they're doing it's just they've got to work around bojo so you believe you believe in the middle in the middle in, in the middle class civil servant oligarchy is what you're saying i I know, some, I know. Some, I know. Uh, I would call them more technocrats, um, <laughs> which I don't see. Which I don't see as a bad thing because a, a technocracy oh. is a technocracy is ruled by experts, right? Well, one of your experts is the one that got the the COVID death rate off by a margin of ten, right? Like literally, <laughs> he got it wrong by a margin of ten. He said it was going to be ten times more lethal than it was, which was part of what encouraged massive lockdowns. And then, of course, after that was proven absolutely wrong, which everybody agrees was absolutely wrong, and all the stats have shown is absolutely wrong, the lockdowns nevertheless persisted, right? Um, and they did work. It just takes a couple of weeks um, for, the, for the lag to catch up. Um, I think one of the last times we had an argument about this, I said, give it two weeks, and lo and behold, after two weeks, the... The rates went back down. Right, so, but what do you yeah. do after two weeks? What do you just lock people down forever? Like, well, what the hell do you do? You, you use the time to um, build up the resilience in your health service and to get as many people as possible vaccinated, which seems to be how we're how we're finally sort of breaking out of this. So, but, but how long? I mean, that was the excuse originally, right? To, Fifteen days to flatten the curve to save the health service, you know, in the UK, to save the NHS and in other parts to whatever, save whatever health service people have. Right. Um, yeah. But how long does it take to do that? Right. Because the, you well, know, like if the argument is, I mean, it's a, because it's not a coherent argument to say, if you're locked down, there won't be infections because there continue to be infections throughout the, the difference between Florida and New York was basically negligible in, t- in terms of infection rates, death rates, all that in the long term. They all they end up being the same. Right. Sweden ended up being the same as most other European countries. They didn't lock down, right? Now, the difference could be an argument uh, of right. you know, emergency services, right? Like Italy well, famously well, had really shitty emergency services and and had a lot of unnecessary deaths because of that. I will completely acknowledge that, right? 
Uh, okay, yeah, well, but, well so, pundit, pundit, slow down because I think I think uh, Graham wanted to respond to one thing. So if we just do it slower, I think we'll like have a more <laughs> fruitful conversation. Um, the ca the case of Sweden, the, ca the case of Sweden, everyone talked them up for a lot of time, but then things got pretty catastrophic in in Sweden pretty rapidly, and their own government and health advisors have all come out and said, "Okay, we we should have taken this more seriously. We should have locked down more. We should have brought in more restrictions." Yeah, we were trying something different. It it didn't work out. So, but I I don't think there's any doubt that we needed to do these things, and and how much worse it would have been if we didn't. I mean, the reason I haven't been able to get my MRI body scan yet is because they're completely clogged up with post COVID patients who need to be checked for blood clots on their lungs uh, and so on. So our health service is is massively stretched. Um, of course, it's been undercut for decades. Well, I'm sorry, but but part of no, no, but part of the reason why you can't get your health tests now is because um, the lockdowns themselves caused the cancellation of a whole bunch of medical tests and exams. Yeah, that are now backlogged. Right, if there hadn't no, been a lockdown and that was continuing throughout the period of the COVID pandemic, there would be much less of a backup to to deal with. Yeah. Right. That that's that's true, um, but our our health service operates on the basis of, of triage, whereas say the American health service works on the basis of how heavy your your wallet is. So, by triage I you mean, mean death panels, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, where can you apply the the best and most help? Uh, how can you benefit the largest number of people? What's what's the biggest problem? Yeah, you you prioritize like you would on a battlefield and that's happening in this in the states as well um i think it was florida uh where they're having to just abandon people you don't have a good chance of surviving so we're gonna have we're gonna put the resources where we can save people so that happens everywhere but it's just that that's how our health system operates normally anyway um i still think the world of our health service well you you, you know i've got men I've got mental health issues. I'm open about it. Everyone knows. I, you know, I barely shut up about it. The NHS is terrible for mental health issues because in, in terms of triage, ongoing mental health issues cost a lot of money, uh, cost a lot of time, uses up a lot of resources. So, you know, it, it's, it's bad for me, but I can understand why and why they would want to put those resources in, in, into other things. So well, you, yeah, want, you I, want to talk about the the consequences of of lockdown, the the um, the how would you call it the the collateral damage of lockdown? You can look at the crisis of mental health that the lockdown has caused in all categories of people, but in, especially in children and adolescents that have had massive spikes in mental health issues because of you know having their entire lives disrupted. Um, not to mention all the people whose businesses went bankrupt because of the lockdowns, right? So there's a, a, a there are there are scars, psychological scars that were caused by not by the pandemic but by the lockdown that are going to last for generations because of that. Right? Yeah, I mean our our government has been surprisingly generous uh, for a Tory government in terms of furlough schemes and support, not so much for the small independent businessmen. So you know. Fuck me, I guess. Um, but it's not been quite so bad here because a lot, a lot of investment has been made. And the suicide rate has gone up, but it's nowhere like the amount of deaths we would have seen from a completely unfought pandemic. So, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a grim calculus, but it, overall it's, it's less dead people. Well, um, Graham, what, what do you think that, like, what is the death rate for COVID? Globally, last <laughs> last time I checked, it's a, something like um, 2%, I think, of people who are infected. And they think about 60% of the world will eventually have had an infection. Uh, so the early predictions, y you can you can imagine, you know, even two percent that that would be a lot of people. But with the vaccinations now making it so much more survivable, um, I I, th I think there's hope. And well, I, you know, I'm as an example, that's a very interesting question Job asks, because as an example in terms of statistics um, of how 
the lockdown is a political issue and not a medical issue. Um, they did this wide scale study of people uh, asking, you know, first off, they identified as being conservative or liberal. It was a U.S. study, but I'm pretty sure that you're going to see similar. You would have seen similar results in other countries where they first identified a person's political affiliation. And then they asked them um, what percentage of people who get covid end up having to be hospitalized. And what mm. they found is that um, people who identify as liberal got it massively wrong by, by excess, right? So uh, liberals, uh, the largest percentage of liberals thought that over 50% of people who get COVID have to be hospitalized, right? When the real number yeah. is something closer to like 2%, right? <laughs> and uh, yeah. I conservatives thought, also got is it that, wrong. Is, is that 2% also... now or is that... Uh, with with the heavy vaccination, or is it? No, I believe it's I believe it's overall in in the course mm. of the, the the pandemic, right? Um, and and now conservatives also got it wrong, also by overshooting the the the, the number, right? But I, I, which I think is a product of of media hysteria about it, because if you watch the news, you think, well, if you get COVID, you know, fifty percent chance you go well, you know, if you're if you're watching CNN, you're going to think there's a fifty percent chance that you're going to be in hospital. And I guess maybe if you're watching Fox, you'll think there's a 35% chance, which is still ridiculously wrong, right? Um, yeah. But then there was another very interesting factor, which is that they also asked the people about their level of education, okay? So when you looked at the right-wing people, when you divided the numbers between right-wing people who had um, college-level education and those who didn't, the ones who had college level education, the number of the, the, the incorrect range of their of their prediction went way down. So they they were thinking it was like 10 percent of people get mm -hmm. hospitalized, which is still too high, but a lot lower. Right. Um, whereas the, 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 the conservatives who were not college educa educated assumed it was higher. Um, but with liberals, there was hardly any change. Right. So you could have liberals with PhDs or liberals who had never graduated high school and they still thought you know, that the percentage was somewhere between 40 and 50% of people getting hospitalized. You know? Yeah, well, yeah, you know, if you've got a PhD in underwater basket weaving, it's not exactly going to help you with statistics. Is... <laughs> touché, sir, <sorry>, touché. <laughs> what anyway. I find what, one thing I find fascinating is how anti-vax has swapped political polls. Yeah, it oh, yeah. used to be all these granola-munching um, stupid liberal, to, to, to quote the Simpsons, you know, liberal but not stupid liberal. They were the anti-vaxxers. Now it seems to be this... Um, I don't even know if you can really... Uh, populist conservatives? I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't, I, don't, I don't know what the right term is. but Anti-authoritarian? Yeah, populist is probably... It's definitely, term. yeah, po populist right. It's, it's Now they're the anti-vaxxers. It's just... It, that's been interesting. And I find... I'm kind of looking at what's going to be the aftermath of this. I mean, we're both historians, right? After the Black Death, there was this massive upheaval. Now, this is nowhere near as bad, but it would be interesting to see how businesses and so on adapt after this, you know, because everyone now realizes, oh, I can do my job from home. Yeah, from well, that life. is going to be a big change. Yeah, there'll be way more people working from home, for sure. For yeah, sure. and uh, and like after the Black Death, there is this and now this this massive upward pressure on on wages because people want to yeah. be yeah rewarded. Yeah, but, and, and companies though, there are there are a lot of companies that will have figured out. Well, hang on, why are we paying for all this office space when our employees can do this from home? Right. So right. it's actually something that turns out to be beneficial on both sides of kind of the the corporate interest, yeah. right? Well, yeah. But there's uh, not you don't follow Sorry, this in no. the U.S., but like you know, we've had upward pressure on 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 lower income uh, <clears throat> jobs here. You know, like if you go to McDonald's, the, just the McDonald's down the street from here, they have a big banner, sixteen dollars an hour. My fourteen year or sixteen year old daughter got her first job. She's after tips, she makes like twenty six dollars an hour now at the at a local restaurant, um, yeah. which is just unfathomable <laughs> to me for her I first job. But <clears throat> actually, I, I probably follow American politics more than I do British politics at the moment because ours mm. is just so tawdry and depressing. 
but but okay so anyway my point was from what you were saying is that and then uh we, there's also been articles about now how google is telling you know remote employees they're going to lower their 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 incomes which is you know probably people at a, a higher income bracket um <clears throat> but at the same time we got inflation here that's like basically wiping away um these gains at the lower end of the spectrum so I don't know. I mean, it's a mixed bag. You know, when you say that that incomes are higher, like, yeah, but we've got massive inflation in the U.S. And I'm sure and in, in, I don't know how it is in England, but. Um. Uh, well, our big problem at the moment is um, keeping shelves stocked, which is. Uh, yeah, we're having uh, supply uh, chain issues here, too. Yeah, it's it's a it's a Not here. <laughs> here is the success model of the West. You know? <laughs> <laughs> All the stores are stocked. Thank you very much. Flash Gordon in the in the live chat has made an important point as to what you were talking about the, the switch in anti-vaxxers. He says we're not anti-vax, we're anti-mandate. And while that's not a hundred percent true, because I mean there was always um it before COVID, let's say, there was anti-vaccination movements that you saw in the very far right, in some sense, of people who are um certain groups of like, you know, weird Christians and things like that, you know, like Seventh-day Adventists that, that don't believe yeah, in that yeah. sort of stuff, right? And then on the far left of, you know, the hippie crowd that were, you know, all all natural organic foods and don't trust these medical things. And also kind of like the, the liberal soccer moms that had bought into this idea that vaccines can cause autism or something like that, right? Yeah. Um, and what has happened now is that, yes, you do still have some people on the right who are suspicious of the vaccines, um, but but what you actually really have is is a is a reaction that has been caused by the fact that that, that alongside this this impulse towards vaccination you have um, you have all of the politics of the lockdown which seems like a police state totalitarian big government plan right and and to say well you know you guys don't actually have to keep your houses and keep your small businesses because we're just going to give you money by these massive budget um, allocations that we're doing and. And, and uh, you know, then we're going to have more control over you, right? And, and, and so that, and then the idea of things like vaccine passports, you know, show us your papers, please, if you want to buy a burger, you know, um, is something that is fundamentally uh, against, you know, right-wing ideas. The, the thing yeah. is that years ago, those would have been against uh, democratic Western left-wing ideas too, you know, the, just, and just like the left has shifted on censorship, it's now shifted on the idea of giving government control over everybody's lives, you know. Yeah, Which is I mean, scary my, my my instinct is always to volunteerism and anti-authoritarianism. But that, so, are you, you know, opposed that, to vaccine mandates? Uh, because I'll, yes, I'll, first, let me say yes, while, you, but, while you're thinking about that, let me say I am a hundred percent in favor of the the vaccine. I think I, I think there's very clear evidence that it, even though it's it's not a hundred percent effective, it works enormously well. And people who are vaccinated, especially people at risk, because there's a lot of issue about the demographics of the risk too, right? Um, yeah. People at risk um, have a huge reduction in the danger to their lives if they're vaccinated, undoubtedly, right? And and large scale vaccination can significantly reduce the rate of infection. So all of that is true, right? But but I'm quite opposed to the idea of forcing the vaccine either in a hard or soft manner, you know? Yeah. I mean, if we can get to herd immunity by people volunteering to take the vaccine, then this isn't something we need to worry about. If there's that much vaccine hesitancy, then we should use softer ways to try and persuade people like they already have, like paying you to get it or um free tickets to something or you know discount coupon book or whatever else they've been trying now they're talking about maybe bringing <clears> it in as as a mandate for, to fly um you know you'll have to be vaccinated if you're going to fly things like that yeah it's it's not ideal but it's the least worst option i think yeah but it, i mean uh, isn't herd immunity the out the window there is, there with, is no with a leaky vaccine i mean how are we going to get a uh, herd immunity if I mean, I know that's like the the goal is like to reach herd immunity, but how are we going to do that if the if you can get reinfected? 
like whatever it is. Yeah, the, 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 vaccine, the type of vaccine we're talking about does not make you immune to catching it, right? Re- reduces well, the no, risk of catching it, but you yeah, know, the, the mean, argument, oh, if, if we have 100% vaccination, the lockdowns will stop. We know that's a bullshit argument, right? Like that's not going to be what it, happens. We're not going to get 100% <laughs> vaccination because there's always going to be holdouts. But yeah, no vaccine is perfect. People still get diseases. Um, this one works in a different way to others. We're one about boost, booster shots now to keep people up, but it does reduce the chance of spreading it. And then if you do get it, you're less likely to show symptoms, so you're less likely to spread it. You're less likely to be hospitalized. You're less likely to die. Yeah. So, but what usually happens with these kind of diseases is that they become endemic, but as a much weakened form of what they what they are. So something mm-hmm. more more akin to the seasonal flu. Um, which you know kills a lot of people, but nowhere near the the numbers that we're that we're talking about here. Which brings up the issue of natural immunity once again. Here, Flash Gorgon points out natural immunity is being ignored because it's free, right? So, well, it's ignored there, in the U.S. That- but Grim, I mean, I don't know about England, but I think all, all around Europe, if you can prove that you were infected, they'll accept that, right? Um, I'm not sure. I'm not. Well, I'm not, not for some things. That. I knew, for example, in, in, in parts of Canada, they have now imposed very strict vaccine mandates where there are people that are losing their jobs. In fact, there's members of, of parliament for different provinces that because they're not vaccinated are not being allowed to enter into the parliament of their of their province and and represent the people who elected them to go there um, and professors in universities, students in universities. Um, and and almost all of those mandates have no provision for people who have, you know, antibodies that were developed naturally. It's either you you get the the Pfizer or the Moderna or whatever vaccine, or um, or or you you lose your job. Yeah, right? I I think the vaccine gives you a stronger immune response. I was reading something about that this this morning. So it is better protection. And even if you have had the COOF, you should get the vaccine. Um, But most places are, I don't know if this is the case in the the US, but most places are saying, well, you can either have the vaccine or you can be tested very regularly, which, which is another relatively harmless way of dealing with it. I think your comparison with censorship was, was a good one. Um, because I, I think most of our audience and probably most of us are, are pretty close to, to free speech absolutists. But we would say, I think we would say that there are or can be exceptions. Uh, the, the harm principle is a good guide, right? The the only reason you should deprive someone else of liberty is if, if they're going to cause harm through through action or inaction. So something like, publishing in fine detail how to make an atom bomb in your basement for a hyperbolic example yeah maybe we should restrict that access to that information because but hate speech are. should not be considered harm, no, right no 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 okay. and and then in this case you know um i understand the concerns because my instinct is always to be anti-authoritarian <laughs> and anti-hierarchical and to be suspicious of any expansion of the powers of government but at the same time, yeah, this is a this is a, a medical situation. The time to be upset, I think, will be as the disease fades away, if our governments continue to use these powers that they have called to themselves. Yeah, that's the time to re- to resist and stand up when they're no longer necessary. Well, Robert Heinlein once said. There's there's nothing so permanent as temporary emergency measures. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, I do have to interrupt you guys because one of our uh, beautiful super listeners, chat. Marv Alice, uh, gave us another super chat. So, you know, if you guys are going to super chat, we're going to interrupt everybody to, to read it out. So uh, Marv Alice says, we're not going to get to 100% vaccination, in quotes. So does that make it okay to about Talk the benefits of 100% vaccination? Them lying is still bad. Oh, well, uh, they typoed here, but I think they're saying, so does that make it okay for them to lie about the benefits of 100% vaccinations? Because lying is still bad. What do you think, Grim? Um, I haven't really heard anyone say that we can get to 100% vaccination. Everyone talks about herd immunity, which is about 60%, I 
think. So that that that's the target. Then anything we can get over that is is good. So oh, they're they're well, saying again, here that herd immunity is like ninety percent or something now, or eighty over eighty percent. Our our, well, uh, they keep, our pushing it up. They keep pushing it up because because they tried to present at first like the vaccine would make you immune, but it doesn't, right? Like here in Uruguay, we're down to about eighty-seven cases a day, but we're you know, but there's you know eighty percent vaccination. You know, people have had the eighty percent of people have had both. Uh, two vaccinations already right two or more yeah. because there's already people having third round vaccinations so it it's very clear that you know you're not going to get to a magic number where there will stop being covid infections because of well, vaccination it, no but the the idea is to get the um the r number right down so that the people who are being infected aren't infecting tons of other people <clears> um <throat> which which the vaccines help with so Did yeah you... don't 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 let the perfect be the enemy of the good. I guess is the yeah. Is the Dave thing. Deadman uh, apparently is is an Aussie. He just he just commented uh, here in Australia we're fucked. It is a bloody police state here now. Our freedoms are not coming back. So, I mean, I I really think that you know that's the threat of uh, you know not responding to this really. I th I, I, I'm can more, I'm more... really claim in any way to be morally better than China at this point? You know, like <laughs> Jesus, you've seen you've seen the video of what they're doing there. You know, it's just unbelievable. Yeah. I'm 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 more optimistic, or at least uh, which is unusual for me. Um, I I think a lot of places will give up these powers. I'm most worried about my own country. Um, I do not. As one should government. be. Yeah, I do not trust this government. Um, I don't think America is going to lapse into being a police state. I don't know enough about Australian politics to to comment, really. I, well, my, my position is that, you know, the, the country that got it all right is Uruguay. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and that's just not patriotism speaking. It's not political partisanship speaking. I wasn't, <laughs> I, was, I belonged to no political party in Uruguay before now. But um, but uh, Luis Lacage, uh, who we call Cuquito Lacage, is uh, is to me one of the greatest politicians in the world today because he stood up to the opposition party, the communists. Obviously, he stood up to world pressure. He stood up to supposed medical experts, and he got it right. And Uruguay has 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 done well thanks to him. You know, and and I can't imagine. You know, he got into power just before the pandemic started. And I can't imagine what this, well, I can't imagine what this country would be like. Our neighbor, Argentina, is, is an absolute clusterfuck um, because they had uh, their, the, you know, socialist Peronistas in power and, and um, tried to do massive lockdowns. And now they have, I don't know, their, their ninth or tenth default on their, on their loans, you know, and, uh, and mass poverty and everybody's trying to get out of that country. You know? But then on the other hand, Brazil has been pretty fucking horrific. Um, I have a, a lady friend who's a junior doctor uh, from a family of doctors. Her mother was a nurse. Her, her father uh, was a doctor. She's lost both her parents to COVID. Um, and I haven't heard from her for a, for a worrying amount of time now. So I don't know, I don't know what's going there. But they, obviously they were on the front lines in the hospitals. And Bolsonaro's not exactly done a, done a good job there. Well, uh, I don't know if we have any Brazilians in the chat right now. I know that I've got some Brazilian fans, and I've got <laughs> a Brazilian. Yeah, <laughs> so uh, so they might want to comment. But um, the thing about Brazil is that Brazil has um, a different level of power between the, the the executive and regional, provincial powers and city governments that that mm. often have the ability to overrule their. Um, the executive and and then also the courts, which are very corrupt. And, and, and so um, there was a, a large amount of um, there wasn't a single policy in place there. Right. And what you did get is obviously a lot of those governments and parts of the court system were were very opposed to Bolsonaro and were trying to politicize the pandemic as an anti Bolsonaro measure. All of that said, Brazil is still in much better shape, both economically and socially than Argentina. You know, Argentina is mm. the new 
the new Venezuela of, of, of South America. It's a disaster. Mind, mind you, the uh, Brazilian health minister just got COVID, which uh, I find funny. And oh, well, so I mean, a lot yeah. of people get COVID. This is part of the problem of statistics, too, is that, that you know, when you're looking at um, risks of death rates and so on, right, um, people, people who are under 70 without comorbidities have a tiny, tiny level of risk, right? And and so, um, you know, and, and when you get to like the higher age ranges, people 50 and up, let's say, um, you re- you have certain statistics that, that, that skew in one sense or another, uh, but like um, they're not, you know, the, the, if you take the average of that, you're not getting an accurate picture, right? Because you have, is somebody who's, who's in the, um, in the range of, being in their in their 60s let's say you could look at it just at, at the face of it and say well you know you've got a a one in 50 chance if you catch covid of dying right but that's that's not technically accurate because someone who's in their 50s and is not obese and doesn't have comorbidities actually has something like uh you know one in a thousand chance of dying and someone who's in their 60s yeah. and is obese or has comorbidities has like maybe a one in 12 chance of dying right so so there's there's uh you know, factors that 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 the the averaging of maths doesn't take into account either, right? Yeah, um, this is a this is a, this is not a weird this is not some kind of weird disease that kills people in their healthy prime. This is a disease that is an opportunistic disease in the exact sense of the flu, right? That the flu kills people who are already old, sick, you know, weak and dying, or who have you know serious health issues they're the ones that are at risk and COVID is exactly the same in that sense. Right. It's not a, yeah. it's not a, it's a disease of, of, of that, that kills people that are already in a weakened situation. Uh, and so a sensible policy would be a policy that would focus on those people and on, and on providing maximum protection for those people rather than these kind of blanket measures. It's brought home to me, um, a, a couple of things which, um, are going to be big concerns going into the future. I think it's it's brought home to me exactly how fragile our society is, and all the infrastructure and all the, you know the just in time shipping, all the other things. They're they're really on a knife edge at, at, at every moment. There's no yeah, just in time was not built for this. Yeah, that's absolutely no, there, there's there's no resilience to the system that we've constructed because this isn't this could be a much worse disease. And but, you know, but for in, me, in it's some also ways... brought in. Sorry, it's also brought in a, a shocking and for me very surprising concern of the, the the fragility of our democracy and our our level of protection for civil liberties. You know that that um, I had never expected such a large group of people to be so easily scared into giving up fundamental freedoms. Yeah. You know? mm. I mean, uh, to to wrestle us back on onto our actual topic of, uh, of gaming a bit, um, yeah, I've written yeah, something. Ab- yeah, I've written <laughs> something about a plague and about uh, a, a, a zombie uprising during a uh, you know a, a plague, <laughs> and so a lot of people acting like zombies. But uh, certainly, if I ever come to to writing more sort of post apocalyptic fiction or something, it's going to be a lot darker now. I'm going to have a lot less expectation of people to to pull together and get through it. You know, if we did, if we ever did have a zombie apocalypse, I now know that people would be basting themselves in gravy and charging out and asking to be bitten. It's just that no. I, I, I have a m- much darker view of how we how resilient we are now yeah i I could say that if i ever write a a dystopian setting um i would i would no longer feel the need to have very heavy-handed techniques for creating people willing to uphold the dystopia right we've we've proven Mm -hmm. in this society now that suddenly there's there's a huge percentage of people that would have happily 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 been stasi informants in, in in east germany you know if they'd they had the chance people who are literally reveling in the idea of taking away other people's freedoms yeah and in a lot of ways it 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 this trend is is both sides of a simplistic political spectrum you know you've got you've got bounty hunters hunting down 
uh, women who want abortions in Texas. And then on the other side of the line, you've got yeah, the brutal repression of people in Australia. Um, and you've got a, certainly got a, a power grab for authoritarian measures, which I'm still slightly optimistic they'll give up voluntarily in most of the countries, but it remain, remains to be seen. Yeah, you're too trusting. Yeah, well, and, and I don't you know, get, I don't understand your whole often. fucking. Now I understand your politics. You just you're naive. It's okay. <laughs> I, I, I'm glad you kind of brought up abortion there because it's very interesting to see a whole bunch of people, um, you know, that that say my body, my choice when it comes to abortion, but then say, well, you know, we should just force people to be vaccinated. You know, like uh, I think there's a fundamental cognitive dissonance going on there um because i well, i mean you know if you're if you're if you don't believe in the woman's right to choose then i guess you would at least be logically co coherent in saying also people could be forcibly vaccinated right but if you I, if you do believe in in the fact that people should have a choice over what they do with their own bodies how the hell can you be justifying this i i don't know that that's a particularly good comparison because you can't get pregnant from someone coughing and eat you. so <laughs> unless i don't know god knows how that would that would happen no, well, that's right you I, have I, the choice to be I, I mean nobody's nobody's saying people should be pre prevented from being vaccinated right uh, so, you know yeah the, the, but it's it's your body it's your choice what you do with it right but uh, but the 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 difference is that at least <laughs> how to put this um one is a communicable disease right now you can take all the precautions in the world nothing is perfect and other people are then being irresponsible with your health so they're impinging upon upon your choices it's it's, it's the classic freedom from versus freedom to um, clash I mean, if you choose not to get vaccinated, if you choose not to wear a mask, if you choose to go and hang around with lots of other people, it's not just you that is being affected by those choices. Yeah, you know, the all... argument could be if you choose not to use a condom, then you're going to yes. have to live with the human life that is developing in your womb, right? That would be that would be a, the, 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 the pro-life perspective, right? Yeah, but um, con condoms, but condoms break, you know, shit, shit happens. Um, but I, I just don't think it's a particularly valid comparison because there's there's too many too many differences. I mean, any any allegory, any metaphor, any comparison you draw always breaks down under close examination. But that breaks down early enough that I just I don't think it's valid. Well, the fundamental argument is that you either believe people have autonomy over their own bodies or they don't. You know, like you're you're you're. But do they have autonomy over my body? Nose. That is a fundamental libertarian concept, right? You can't call yourself a libertarian if you don't believe that your freedom ends at my nose. Yeah, yeah, but if you've coughed a bunch of disease droplets, they're going to float up my nose. So you know, it does, it does, it does breach other people's freedom. So then you have to figure out, okay, what's what's the balance here? How do you preserve the greatest amount of freedom for the greatest number of people? You know, it's. Well, it, I mean, it's, you're you're free to be vaccinated and therefore protected against the effects of my cough. You know, or well, Avengers cough because I'm not coughing. <laughs> <laughs> but again, you know, nothing's perfect, and there are people who can't take the vaccine for medical reasons, and you're placing them at risk. So it's like, yeah, you, know, you might have the right to own a firearm, but you don't have the right to just fire randomly into a shopping mall. <laughs> Right, it, you, you've got to balance the two together: the freedom from and the freedom to. Um, and you are impinging on other people. So right, but I mean, the the false equivalency there would be like shooting a gun at somebody is not like breathing fifteen feet away from them. I mean, oh well, uh, make it uh, make it Russian roulette. <laughs> um, yeah, I just mean that. Like there is like a big difference between the two. It's it you know in in the in the. Because if to, you wash um, your hands and like wear a mask, like you're low, you much lower your your chances of, of communicating to other people. So. Yeah, but they would be even lower if other people act responsibly. Right, but we're, the, we're talking about fractions of percentage points at that point. It's like 
know, to me, it's yeah, like, but, fuck then off. It, but then at a civilizational scale, um, that's still a lot of people. Um, okay, well, is it, is it is it one in? Oh, I, I can't remember the statistic, but um, no, yeah, never mind. Let's let's move on before my blood <laughs> pressure spikes and I have a stroke on stream. <laughs> I'm just trying to win We're the trying. time. I want, I want to get the IP for for Whitechester. <laughs> If I can make you stroke out, I win, right? I get, I get, I get all the proceeds. Avengers already out as far as, you know, it sure, sure looks like by, by not down, hanging so, up. So it's going to come down to me or joke people. Keep placing your bets right now as to which of us will be the last well, inappropriate character. I, actually, I have, I, I did make provisions in case something happened to me. So Oh, well, that's good to know. I, uh. You know, sometimes recently I've been feeling I'm, I'm a bit like Belisarius, you know, the last of the true Romans, you know, <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> living in a world where, where, where everybody else has just given up on all of their principles for, you know, because they're afraid of a cough. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't think I have. I mean, I've always been more more left wing than, than you guys and much more communitarian. Uh, it's very weird to be called naive and optimistic. I'm normally considered a <laughs> pessimist and a cynic. <laughs> oh, okay, wait, I got to interrupt you guys because we got another, uh, another uh, what do you call it? I can think of it. Super, Super chat. chat. Super Marv chat. Alice, $5 American. It's going to be uh, a beer that you and <laughs> me and Benjamin will money. split. And then, <laughs> and then uh, if we see Graham, we'll, we'll have to get, you know save some part of it for him. Jim, you do not have a right to get. Oh my God! Do sick. Not, do not you get have a sick. right for people not to purposely infect you with a bioweapon, but the police cannot viruses. Cannot arrest viruses. She means. Oh, okay. Okay, but you don't have a right to place other people at risk. Like you don't have a right to drunk drive. Right. <clears throat> I mean, well, you know, you the might... argument for that is is you 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 would have. It is it is entirely sensible that um well everywhere except california that if you have an infectious disease you can't go around intentionally infecting people right i mean except in california yeah, I mean, where it's that's... illegal it's completely legal for you to infect someone with hiv but in the rest of the world it's kind of seen as as <laughs> as criminally thing. criminally dangerous right so if you yeah. had a positive i would certainly think it's 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 a there's a legitimate argument to be made that if someone was tested positive for covid um, they they would there would be an argument for them um, having to you know stay at home or whatever or or um, you know that they would have to take all reasonable measures to prevent the risk of infecting others right yeah I mean uh, but that's going... very different from saying that someone who is not infected with COVID should be forced to take a, a vaccine that was produced you know less than less than less than twelve months ago. Um, uh, because because other people feel that they should be forced to take that vaccine, right? It, it, Pundit, you know, I feel like this was a good conversation, but I, I really have been dying to ask one more question about to Jim, like an interview question. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. We can I, go I back. To, good, to I think talk. I thought it was great, but like let's like let's just move on. I think at this point. <laughs> all right, all right, fair enough. Cool? Go ahead. Okay, so one thing I wanted to call out that because uh, uh, a lot of our listeners might not know, I'm sure people are tuning in because they're fans of uh, Grim Jim. Um, uh, Gamergate. I want to know all about how you got involved with Gamergate. I know this isn't going to be a short story and we're like way <laughs> long into the show, but I really want to hear about it because if people don't know, like uh, I'm sure a lot of you guys know who James Lindsay is, um, you know, from the the Sokol Squared uh, hoax and, and Peter Bogosian, Helen Puckrose, that stuff. But he actually like references Grim Jim, Grim Jim's book on Gamergate. He actually... Grim Jim took the time to write a book on Gamergate and try to like document everything at the time. So I just, I really want to know J uh, Grim Jim, just, just to call out and, and make sure the audience knows about this, but also for you to just kind of tell us like, how did you get involved with Gamergate? Because I think that's that's pretty epic that you were there at that time and that, and that, uh, and just, you know, that you documented it and, and all that stuff. So, um, okay. So I've always been both interested in and pretty heavily involved in anti-censorship um, movements and and particularly around games. Um, just sort of growing up in that in, environment where 
the things were heavily repressed, this sort of video nasty panic, the satanic panic in particular. Um, you know, I did school projects where I produced leaflets to educate people about how, you know, D and D and so on wasn't wasn't satanic. So that was my kind of route to to be involved. Um I'm trying to think how to how to summarize this all fairly quickly. So people like to say that Gamergate was about this one woman, um, Zoe Quinn. It it wasn't. That was the spark. That was the Archduke Ferdinand thing. Now I had previously been a supporter of Zoe Quinn. She put out a game called Depression Quest. It wasn't particularly good. It wasn't yeah, massive technical exercise or anything, but it was quite helpful for me to help other people understand my depression. So I, I supported her. Then all this controversy um, came out around her. Um, her ex-boyfriend, basically, it seems like he was emotionally abused by her. Um, and he kind of spilled the tea on, on their on their whole relationship and how she'd been cheating on him and so on. But that wasn't interesting. What was interesting um, was that I had been supporting this person and that they had been playing favors with, with certain people and, and getting additional coverage and so on for it. Not necessarily quid pro quo, but these journalists who were covering her and, and picking her up and so on weren't disclosing their relationships. So that was, that was the scandal. Okay. Wasn't really that interested in that. Eh, thought it would just kind of blow over, but then this massive wave of censorship started. Yeah. You know, even 4chan was censored. Nobody was allowed to discuss this or uh, the, the things that had been gotten up to or the fact that the the computer games uh, media was complicit in all this, weren't operating ethically, and were shutting down all discussion of this, and so people really sort of turned, <laughs> yeah, the the eye of Sauron upon the games media and started uncovering all kinds of other shady practices, you know, good good reviews for Paola, things that we knew were happening in the past. But this was so much worse because a lot of these indie designers and so on had presented themselves as being better, um, not being part of that that world, the 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 grind and the sleaze and the and everything. But it was the censorship that really um, got me engaged, got me interested. From my point of view, it was another moral panic like I'd seen with video nasties, like I'd seen with comics, um, like I'd seen with role-playing games in particular. And it made no sense to me that other creative people in that industry or adjacent industries like, like ours weren't standing up and fighting. So it was a, it was a very weird rude awakening for me to see that these people who i'd fought side by side with against the satanic panic and the vampire panic later on and so on weren't willing to stand up on this which seemed weird because computer games is it's a bigger industry than hollywood um you know the amount of money sloshing around is not insignificant so it's important culturally financially in so many ways, and yet they weren't willing to stand up. And so what led me to write the, the, the book, the sort of history of Gamergate, was it turned out the reason that so many of them were unwilling to stand up was because the media narrative was so utterly sort of airtight and one-sided that they didn't know what it was about, they didn't understand what had happened, or they were too terrified <laughs> to, to stand up and say anything. And it was obvious to me that it was only that media narrative that would be remembered. Um, so it was important to have a history from inside, uh, from the other point of view, though I strove to be as neutral as possible and to back everything up as, as much as possible. 
but I felt that it was really important to have that that record, however insignificant it was going to be. Um, yeah, and it certainly wasn't going to make a make a huge difference, but just just to have that record, just to set the record straight. Well, there's certain straight. people in you know in media that will not let Gamergate die, and uh, no, I think no, they... that you wrote that down. I think is going to like inform people in the in the future. So I hope so. Thanks for doing um, that. C- certainly, uh, my book seems to get mentioned a lot whenever anyone spuriously brings up Gamergate when they're arguing about something else. So, uh, I I don't know, but um, it was a worthwhile project. I think it was worth doing. Well, uh, I, and that book is free, right? People can download it. I think that's what I did. Uh, you can listen to it on my YouTube channel. Um, otherwise, it's available. Uh, if you've got that Amazon Unlimited thing, you can read it for free. I think uh, in ebook format. Um, oh, I think that's where I saw it. Yeah. 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 Anyway, I just was uh, just so our listeners, if they want to check it out, they want to get the real the real dope on um, Gamergate. Well, I've got some breaking news for you guys. Um, I just saw that it has apparently been announced at the D and D celebration event. Um, in a panel that featured, among other people, uh, Ray Winninger and Chris Perkins and Jeremy Crawford, that uh, they've announced that Wizards for uh, to come out in 2024 will be doing a new evolution of the three core books. They, they did not call it a new edition, uh, but they said that there's going to be a, basically a radical reworking of... Uh, of these rules, right? Um, essentials. Is that what you're saying? Something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, well, we can all guess what the the political agenda behind that uh, that new evolution is going to be all about. You know, uh, so I guess we'll have to stay tuned for more information about that. There isn't a lot a lot of detail yet of what they're going to be doing, but uh, uh, we all know which way that particular crew is going to to lead this into. So. What do you think is going to happen, Grim? How does that distract you? I was just saying, what's your comment on that, Grim Jim? Um, When they say radical change, it does sound like a new addition in anything but name. Uh, I think that's a mistake. Um, I don't think it's the right time for a new edition. I mean, typically you'll get one every five years or so, but I don't think it's the right time for it. Um, but if someone wanted to set up, uh, wanted to copy what Paizo did and keep going with the fifth edition, now's the time, I guess. I don't know. I guess, I guess we'll see. Maybe they're just saying radical changes and it won't be, it'll just be the same bullshit we've been seeing for a while. But, uh, yeah. Well, they've, they've stated that they're going to rework the three core books. Um, they're, they're saying that it will be backward compatible with fifth edition um and so what that smacks me as being is a mix of a slight some slight rules updates with a large element of cultural update let's say you know, yeah, for their, I, yeah yeah i hear revisionism coming through they're going to change like how the stat you know dwarfs can't have plus two constitution because that's a racist for some reason oh yeah there'll be no <laughs> racial modifiers anymore yeah. that's that's almost for sure you know no more alignment orcs will all be you know uh kind charitable people that have a have a, a vibrant and and uh diverse culture you know? <laughs> so maybe it'll be more of a 3.5 I guess I, I I don't know. There's not enough information to really speculate, but I think we can all, yeah, like you said, the alignment. Racial. I think statistics. we can all agree that it's going to suck. Whatever they, whatever they do, whatever that group of designers decides on, yeah, it's going to be the, bullshit. Given the people that are in charge of wizards, it, I, I'm I'm I would put really hard money that it's going to massively suck. Undoubtedly. <laughs> I I I just really think it's not the right time to do it. That that's that's my main takeaway well you know looking at the success that the dnd is still benefiting from um you know they've left it for yeah it's something that's not going to come out until you know two and a half years from now but but uh, it seems to me like 
the decision to change this is not necessarily based on economic reasons, right? Like there's, there, there, there's still, in spite of, of, of some of the stuff they've been putting out, which I'd say is getting worse, um, there hasn't been a decline in sales. So they're not reacting to that. So the only other thing they could be reacting to is their own internal culture's ideological demands for a D and D that is that looks less like like real D and D, you know? <laughs> yeah, and there's for, for good or ill, a lot of new people have started with fifth edition, and so yeah. they're about to experience their first edition first ever, change. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. let's face it, every every even numbered edition has been crap, right? So the fact <laughs> they're not calling this sixth edition, yeah, and, and all the revised editions, you know, the second edition. Re revision did not save second edition um 3.5 very quickly became became more um straddled with with uh rules bloat than than 3.0 ever was and essentials just was the was basically the nail on the coffin of fourth edition right so um there's never been an edition update that made a game better even on earth arcana didn't make ad and d better you know so there's uh there's no good precedent here from which they can they can uh, claim uh, improvement. All right, you guys want to wrap it up? I see we've been pretty going yeah, pretty long say, for a normal show. There's not enough to know about that. Maybe in two weeks from now there'll be more information, and then we're because yeah. you know inevitably some of these virtue signalers and in, in wizards are going to start saying stuff about it now. So uh, uh, that'll probably be a very interesting topic for you know our our next episode, which will be uh, on, I guess, the 24th of October. And uh, you can, uh, assuming assuming that, that schedules allow, and uh, we'll see whether we'll, we'll, we'll have venture back by then or, or what his situation is going to be. Um, okay, let's, let's take Rim Jim instead. Let's all hope that he's better. Yeah, I mean, if not, maybe we'll have venture guest star again. <laughs> Who knows? Or we'll, or we'll get some other temporary co-host um but thank you very much for being with us again ben, uh grim jim uh we really Thanks, appreciate man, it trip. Almost, almost called you venture there uh, yeah. and, you did uh, already. Yeah. I, re I remember when you interviewed me that's yeah. right yeah you were a guest star for us once when yeah. when it was when that it was, was me grim and you're in the yeah, hot seat motherfucker <laughs> Turnabout is fair play. Um, just, just before we close out, if there were any questions that anyone had about Whitechester or yes, okay, else you guys I've have done. got like a minute right now. Get your get your uh, your 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 final questions in to Grim Jim. Uh, he wants you know questions about what he's pimping first and foremost, Whitechester. Yeah. And then, um, and yeah, and if we run out of time, hunt me down on social media. It's uh, Grimasaur on uh, on Twitter. And um, I'll happily answer any questions you got. Well, while while people are writing their questions, Kevin DeJordi said, Pundit, please tell me you were the one that told Wizards to make the Rangers subpar so there wasn't a Legolas at every D&D table. Well, I can tell you, actually, my advice for the Ranger was to make the Ranger way less of a, of a like, you know, the idea that the Ranger was a magic using class always seemed kind of dumb to me. And so I, I wanted to make the Ranger into much more of the outdoor adventuring type and have have abilities and skills that were that were much more based on the idea of you know him being a woodsman you know and, a, and, a, and, and like the 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 equivalent like the druid being the cleric of the of of the wilderness um he would be the fighter of the wilderness in a much more real sense but you know i i wasn't especially listened to there um Okay, so we, the we got a couple of questions here. So uh, yeah. Indigo Dragon says, where can we get your Grimdark 5e rules? Uh, you can get that at post-mort.com or on drive-thru, and you can buy hard copy at lulu.com. Okay. And, and those links are in the, the show notes too, uh, Indigo. Uh, let's see, we have some more. Uh, Calvin DeJordi asks, Grim, what's the coolest new thing in Whitechester? New thing. Hmm. Okay. This isn't a specific thing, but it's so detailed. There's so much in it, but at the same time, you can just pick it up and play with next to no prep. 
I think that's that's something new. Um, my my whole approach to it has been that to make it insanely detailed, but also accessible. Um, which is something I think more more designers could work hard <laughs> harder at. I think, but uh, yeah, everything is there. So as a DM you don't have to engage in a huge amount of prep and you can still get a good game out of it. Okay, Judd Goswick asks, Grim, did you get my message in quotes about Whitechester? Um, I don't know. <laughs> uh, re resend it. Resend it, Judd. Judd's, a, Judd's good people. Uh, let's see. Do you see anything else in there, Pundit? No, some people talking about rangers, but I don't see any other questions. That's <laughs> yeah, rangers with magic never made any sense to me either. So. Yeah, well, uh, I guess that's that's everything for today. Yep. Stay tuned in four weeks for our for our next episode. You know, and uh, once again, thank you, Grim. You know, I always said when you when you left the show, I said you're always welcome to come back. So whenever you want to, feel free to to let us know if you want to. To yeah. guest spot on your show, you know. I'll, I'll I'll lower my standards next time I've got something to pimp. <laughs> Excellent. That's right. You're 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 betraying everything you believe in in order to sell your products. Well done, sir. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a dog I, eat dog world. I'd really and like to get you to come back, but interesting topless. debate on our on our differences <laughs> of the the issue of the day. So I like that. Uh, yeah. yeah, I I you know I follow you on on Twitter all the time. I don't agree with your politics, Grim, but I love you. I think you're a great person. <laughs> well, that's that's what I like to hear. Okay, you know, so it's 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 nice to be able to talk to people you disagree with. Yes, uh, in a reasonable way. absolutely, absolutely. We, we at the be, end of the day, you're like, really hey, we're still friends. More people who are who are left wing on this show, you know, but so few of them have any balls, you know, that it's. <laughs> Makes it hard yeah. to, to find me that would be that would be brave enough to come on. Yeah, well, I can consider coming back if you if you ever need me in for a particular topic or or something. If you need a left wing perspective, right. Hell yeah. so, <laughs> so if 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 Venger is is uh, is still coughing his lungs out, then uh, we'll we'll let you know in four <laughs> weeks. All right. <laughs> all right. No, no, no. What we need to do is every time Venger's wife makes him go to bed, we'll just we'll just cut his feed and we'll bring in Grim Jim. <laughs> is that still happening uh, it's yeah, still happening, still happening. Yeah. speaking of which if all of you in the audience want to help venture get to stay up later <laughs> then uh be sure to support us on patreon you know that's uh why do you even say that home. you know that's bullshit that's never gonna happen <laughs> oh fuck my battery's dead your battery's gone man <laughs> yeah that's okay well, they can hear me that's never gonna happen yeah. even, even if we got like five thousand dollars a month in patreon Grim's wife, <laughs> not Grim, sorry. Venger's wife is still going to make him go to bed at seven o'clock. <laughs> oh, man. That's funny. Well, wrap, wrap the show. I've got to go to bed. <laughs> All right. All right, guys. Thank you so much, everyone. And uh, we'll see you soon. Check us out on our individual channels. Uh, subscribe to, to Grim's channel, to mine. Uh, does Job have a, Job, do you have a YouTube channel? I don't think I so. I don't, man. I got so many kids. I'm trying to write Brutal Blades. Like, I, I, one day I'll do something. You want to keep right. in touch, keep track of what I'm doing? Just, just come and hang out here on once a month. Fair enough. Oh, also, before just before we go, uh, Venger asked us to, to say that in the next few days he will have uh, the Crimson Escalation PDF up on Drive Through. So, uh, um, if you want to help Venger during his his time of i don't know quarantine or whatever he's in <laughs> uh, check check that out on drive through in the next few days all right thanks everybody That's appreciate it, it. thank See you, you guys thanks you grim, thank grim you. jim hold on a second grim jim we what? are going to close out the stream here One second.